Yeah, welcome to the second half, everyone. Um, yeah, like Coach just said, um, it's a real pleasure to come back um, uh, 12 months after after um, being the recipients of a, of a, of a similar course uh, last year. So hopefully, uh, what I share with you today will, um, you know, uh, give you a, a bit of an insight into uh, the, the development of my project and the various uh, factors that I found. Um, to, to, to be of interest. So, the, what, what, what the project was really about was I was interested in alternative musical histories. I'm sort of fed up with uh, hearing about histories of the Beatles and the Rolling Stones. Um, I was interested in, in uncovering an alternative music history of um, local music making in Merthyr Tidwell. Uh, for those of you who don't know Merthyr Tidwell, it's, um, it was once the, the largest town in Wales. It's, it's got a background of uh, iron production and more recently um, mining. But in the sort of post Thatcherite times, there's been a, a real decline in um, the, 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 the basic, the, the general outlook, I suppose, of the town. Uh, there's a lot of deprivation there. And what I was interested in is uncovering an alternative history as well, an alternative identity that wasn't just associated with, with mining and with iron production. Um, I, I was keen for the, I suppose at this point last year, I hadn't worked through what the various stages of the project were, but I know I was really keen in engaging the community as researchers. Um, so, not just the recipients of, of, of our knowledge, but actually um, to ensure that the community was involved in the knowledge production as well. And I was also uh, really keen to make sure that the, the, the project was um, intergenerational. Uh, I wanted school children involved, but again, at this point last year, I wasn't sure who the school children were going to be. Um, the, the strategic partners were, were to become um, such a, an important part of the, the project. I'll, I'll come more on to them a little bit later. But it, it involved uh, two local schools, it involved a local theatre, um, a local library in Dallas, and we were lucky to have the backing of BBC Wales, which did a lot of the production. And most importantly, we worked with an organisation called First Campus, who actually uh, provided a lot of extra funding, which, which helped um, put some of the activities on. Um, so talking about the hidden histories of Merthyr Tidville, um, this is Pink Floyd playing in Merthyr Tidville um, in 1968, uh, one of the, the, the photographs that, that, that we uncovered. Um, the research questions I, I, I've listed here, but I've already mentioned many of them, uh, the relationship between local music and more mainstream histories. These were the research questions I put in the application last year. It, it feeds forward into um, music making today. Music making in Wales at the moment is, especially at the grassroots level, is really um, in a bit of a crisis. So I suppose one of the broader narratives is uh, how can uh, local music making be, be made more sustainable? But also questions such as um, what are the methodologies, what are the best methodologies of actually capturing music histories, uh, local music histories? Um, how can they be made relevant to the younger generation? Um, and as I said before, this idea of music being a part of your identity. <coughs> so there was three interlocking parts, uh, five activities over the week. Um, the first, we organized a, um, what we called a memory collection um, workshop, uh, where the, the, the library itself actually um, contacted the community members. We, we had 10 community members who, uh, whose memories we recorded uh, visually. We, I, I got a documentary maker in, and uh, these local memories were recorded. You can see here, what was really fascinating about this is that despite the fact that they were involved in um, music making in the, the 1960s, they had not seen each other for 50 years. Uh, this is one of the other stories that's, that came through. Um, so what we did, talking about what one of our colleagues said earlier about um, tabletop activities, we, the, we had a lot of, we had about 200 photographs donated by the community during the course of the project. 
And what I did with some of them was uh, uh, print them up and spent a day getting the community to, to remember their past and to think about what story they were going to leave at the end of it. So by the end of the day, this was on the Friday of the event, we captured nine, in fact it was, nine um, musical memories. And then what we did, we went into two local schools. And in those two schools, we, uh, we taught the children uh, to, uh, to reenact these memories. We devised scripts. Uh, just said to a colleague earlier, this is something I felt really out of my comfort zone with, so I got a director in to do this. So part of the money which uh, First Campus paid for uh, was to uh, pay for this director. And he was amazing with the kids, and um, he, uh, he, his specialism is learning scripts from memory, so there's no script. He, he just worked from the digital stories that were recorded. So you can imagine this week was very really scary. I had no idea where, where it was leading, but we'd done the memory capturing activity. We then had uh, three days in schools. One of the schools had two days, another one just the one. And um, this then led towards this final uh, production that we put on in uh, Theatre Zoe, a, a, a local theatre. Um, it, was, it was really well collect, uh, attended, and, and again, more of the local community of the 1960s in particular, even the 1950s. Some of these guys made music from the, the mid-1950s that were getting together for the first time, who were hearing their stories celebrated and reenacted. The sort of stories ranged from really serious subject matters like um, the Aberfan disaster to, you know, putting your makeup on on a Friday night before you go out for a night on the town. So there were all little miniature stories, little miniature narratives. Um, Using mic, yeah, is that better? Okay, sure. Um, and I think this picture here really um, captured the intergenerational part of it very well, where we've got the children and the older, the older community members together, um, <laughs> celebrating this history which had been unearthed. In terms of the positive outcomes, I mean, what, what I found during the week is that um, when the week started, I honestly had no idea how it was going to turn out. We put a lot of work into the um, the publicity of these events, not just through social me media, but I found with this particular type of community, printed posters and flyers worked really well that we, we put around the town. Um, but the local press, although what, what I found, I, I was concerned it wasn't going to be picked up, but it was picked up, but it happened very late. So suddenly, um, ITV Wales were in touch, the BBC, the local press. It actually made the front page of the Merthyr Express, which uh, <laughs> was, was great, you know, it was a big headline. Um, but also it led forward into, um, I suppose I'll show you the next slide. Um, I thought it was a, yeah, I'll come back. Uh, this exhibition that we, that we, um, that we put on uh, in the January of this year. Um, the, the, the photographs that we, we had donated, uh, actually there were so many of them, we decided to put an exhibition on in the town hall. Um, but yeah, the challenges, what challenges did I have? A tight time frame. It, it, it very much felt out of my comfort zone. Um, although uh, my, the from personal experience, the, the university was of some help. I found the majority of the help come from the external partners. Although external partners have got very different agendas to what we've got. So quite often, you know, you wouldn't get a reply from an email or quite often things are taking place and they're not necessarily telling you that they're taking place. So I think, uh, you know, there's, there's good and bad aspects to, to, to working with local with local partners, but we had a whole range, ranging from, as I said before, you know, organisations like BBC Wales, through to community groups that enabled me to access the local community and, and actually become part of the, the local community. I found by the end of the project, many of these people became my friends. I spent a lot of time uh, working with them. Um, in, involving the press media, I think I've already said that, don't be scared if um, it's coming up to the project and there's no activity. I found it came 
very last minute, but I put a lot of legwork in before that, both social media wise and posters and all sorts of things, actually trying to make it happen, but it did come very last minute. I did find that um, in terms of publicity design, having a logo, um, a logo that sort of runs through the whole project. Obviously the, the Being Human logo is part of it there, but also just having a sort of a graphic that people associate with your project. I think that is a, a, a bit of advice I could give. Um, additional financial support, depending on what your project's going to be, you may need it. Uh, I mentioned before First Campus, they paid, um, I think they gave me about £2,000 to £2,300 to pay for a, a, a film director so that the di I, I knew that there was a documentary made and there was also somebody who staged and managed the final event. A colleague said before, making sure you're not running around doing everything. That quite often costs money. Um, so you, you, you may need to, to, to think about that and get somebody who knows what they're doing with that. Um, copyright and ethics, if you're using photographs, I find all sorts of ownership problems with these images. Uh, you've really got to watch that if you want to use images. Just make sure that um, they're copyright free, in particular if you're, or you've got the permission, I should say, of the copyright holder. There can all be all sorts of complexities with that. Um, yeah, try as you go along when the event happens to, to have someone who captures the event for you, takes photos and um, obviously takes care of any, any visual media um, so that you've actually got evidence and something that, that you can use as a, as a, um, a document to, to give the, the, the project the life as it moves forward beyond the being human event. What, what, what I found, just to finish off, the, the Being Human event obviously ended in the November of last year, but uh, this exhibition came about just after it. Then ITV, ITV did a little broadcast based on this. Um, all of it was public engagement related, um, but I've also managed to get an edited collection out of it, which ticks the more traditional academic box but you know I really a bit like again what my colleague said earlier this was one of the most gratifying experiences of my career I would say to date just more than anything else just knowing that you've you've um, you've changed the perception of what a community originally thought a musical memory was to many people they didn't even think it was of any importance but hopefully the, the, the series of events showed them that um, uh, these sort of alternative histories can be incredibly important. So, yeah, good look at things that moves forward. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks very much for that, Paul. Uh, so I'd like to invite up Trish Winter and Lynn Killey. <laughs> right, so I've got, I've got my notes and my PowerPoint. Is my PowerPoint loaded on Nice to be here from having breakfast at 6 a.m. and traveling down from Sunderland. So, <laughs> that was great, and lots, lots of connections with the research that we've been doing. So, really, really interesting to hear about what you've been doing. Um, right. Um, our festival events were very much integrated with a research project and were in effect a kind of continuation of a research project that had been going on for at that point two years and now going into its fourth year. <coughs> so I'm going to sort of talk, it's difficult to separate out the festival events from the project, so I'm going to talk about both. Um, the project was called Putting Southwick on the Map 
Uh, Southwick is an area of Sunderland, which is quite close to the university. Um, it's an area that, according to the sort of government data, is officially deemed an area of low arts and cultural participation. Um, our research doesn't take that designation at face value. In fact, it takes it as a provocation. Um, and in our view, it fails to account for many of the layers of cultural participation, um, especially in the realm of the everyday, and especially in things associated with working class culture. Southwick is a formerly mining and shipbuilding area that's had that same kind of post-80s economic decline. So we were, we'd been, for two years, been doing a participatory action research project doing cultural mapping. So the idea was that we work with people in Southwick to find out what they think their culture might consist of and what they might value about it. So we worked with a group of people who became community researchers, which is you did, with, with our project. One of those people was Lynn, who's kind of become a colleague. Um, and I'm going to be inviting her to speak in the moment. In fact, when Michael asked me to do this, I asked if we could bring in one of the community researchers, because I think it's really important that that kind of voice gets heard as well. Um, so the community researchers were doing things like um, recording interviews with each other, researching our own areas of interest around culture and Southwick as they saw it. They sort of created and collected and chose materials that were embedded into a digital map. So putting Southwick on the map was about literally creating a digital map with research materials embedded in it. And three of those community researchers went on to lead their own mini research projects working with wider community groups. One of those people was Lynn, and she's going to be talking about that in a minute. So the Being Human Festival proposal sort of evolved out of this project, and basically we saw it as a way of extending the project. It was a kind of another um, sort of facet of the project. Um, and we also saw that it might be a way of sort of valuing and profiling the work of our community researchers on a national level. It is a very little local project in some ways, and we wanted to do that. So we did a range of events over a week, and there were sort of too many really to talk about here. Um, it was pretty overwhelming. Um, but the centre of it all was, it was an exhibition, a sort of pop-up exhibition in a community venue. And we're going to focus on the exhibition here. Um, the community researchers literally created an art gallery in some empty rooms, down to clearing out furniture, painting the walls and everything. They actually created it themselves. So there were two sort of elements. Oh, there they all are. <laughs> this was an example of how your typical um, regional uh, so the newspaper will pose you for a photograph of yeah. the <laughs> <laughs> So one element of the, um, of the exhibition was a, a body of uh, paintings that, that we kind of discovered as part of the research. So um, the, a late Southwick resident called Derek Copeland, had, who worked in the shipyards, um, was interested in painting when he was made redundant in the 80s. He went to university to do art and design. Sadly, he died before he could finish his degree, but his widow, Rosalind, she was around her house where she has exhibited this huge body of paintings documenting the demise of the shipyards and, and kind of leisure time, allotments, greenhouses, holidays, all of that kind of thing. A really amazing body of work. And the, the community researchers thought that there would be huge local interest in exhibiting. It all went on the map in digital form, but they thought people would like to see it exhibited in real life, and the, and the festival gave us an opportunity to do that. <clears throat> uh, the second element of the exhibition was some artwork that was produced by members of the community working with Lynn, who's a visual artist and, and was working with us as a community researcher. So I'll invite her now to talk a little bit about this panel. Thank you. Uh, have you managed to get the um, to work? I'll leave them there. Thank you, yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, there may be a bit of a crisis. My glasses broke this morning, and the lens keeps falling out. <laughs> <laughs> if it does, I have to change glasses. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'm a freelance digital artist currently working in participatory arts and I've been a community researcher with putting Southwick on the map. It's <coughs> now Southwick Reach from just a few weeks into the project. Um, we changed our name to Southwick Reach after that first project of um, planning the, the map and uh, completing the digital map. So now Southwick Reach. Um, I have personal connections to Southwick. My dad lived there as a, as a child, and though a low level living down with myself, I always felt, um, you know, close to that place. And, who, and I, I did visit weekly as a child to visit the local library and joke shop. That was a real treat for me. So I heard about the project and went along um, to one of the meetings. I was really intrigued as to what it was about, and I've worked with the project ever since that first meeting as a community researcher. Last year, I proposed a mini-project, Everyday Life in Southwick. My idea was to implement a visual arts project, but co combine it with research with participants from the local area. So how I wanted to do was, this was to invite the participants to um, come along to this short project, Everyday Life in Southwick, um, to discover you know, past, present and future through their own memories, everyday life and aspirations. I did my own research and I sourced images, brought them along, images to reflect the culture of Southwick. Participants brought along their own personal and very meaningful family, family documents and photographs. The things which sparked memories and generated some fascinating conversations. Elsie, one of our community researchers, came along to record these and also conducted interviews. People also brought images around particular topics, um, you know, important to something like shipbuilding and mining industry, as well as current issues such as the burning down of a, a local historical building, the Savoy, which was important to a lot of people as well. Um, so through individual um, research, the participants created historical, sorry, um, the participants created individual collages through layers of image and each one reflected their own memories, interests and aspirations for Southwick. So these are the collages you've been seeing most and speaking, uh, that they, they were individual to, to each person. And the outcomes were just really wonderful which made my experience so rewarding to you know, facilitate this project. It wasn't just a visual arts project, um, you, you can see the outcome, the visual art that came out of it, but it encompassed research and oral history, and it was just really fascinating. The people were so engaged and enthusiastic. My aim was to en encourage the people when they came to share the stories with each other, but to be honest, they didn't need much encouragement at times. <laughs> I felt like I had to crack the whip. I was, I was worried that the visual work wouldn't be completed. <laughs> so much meaningful conversation was generated and stories was shared. It was just a, a really wonderful experience for both myself and the participants who took part. At our pop-up exhibition, Lost and Found, these lead collages were exhibited Participants were so proud to have their own work shown in a local exhibition. But it also proved to be a tool which stirred the same memories and aspirations and engaged the, the, you know, the local public with the same you know, conversations we'd had in the workshops. Conversations with the participants while they were actually invigilating the exhibition and also with one another. The level of engagement was just wonderful to see. Each collage was both individual and conceptual, and all captured interests from different people. The mayoress of Sunderland, for example, was able to share her own memories and perceptions relating to each artwork, being familiar with the area and spending a lot of time and growing up near to the area of Southwick. The opportunity to showcase this creativity in Southwick was inspiring and exciting for, for myself and each member of the group. 
for me, curating the exhibition was a really enjoyable experience, and especially the war. Our research was fun and interesting for me and all of the community research researchers involved. And through evaluation, it was really evident that the project and a Lost and Found festival had been a huge success for the people of Southwick. This was rewarding for all involved and especially useful for Southwick's way forward and especially in the planning of future projects. Thank you. And you back to the I was going to make three points, but I'm going to actually make four very quickly because I think, I can't remember who it was, I think it might be you mentioned about things being safe. And actually in some ways I think it was very safe what we chose to do, but it was entirely appropriate to, the, to that kind of situation and that we wouldn't have had an audience in, in some, you know, it, was, it actually kind of came from what was needed in that context. Um, so, other things, just to kind of sum up, firstly, I think it's really important the exhibition was really owned by the community researchers and the fact that it was one of the community researchers that curated it was, was a really important aspect of it. And we did also make use, full use of all of the community networks that we'd been nurturing and, and kind of developing over the two years leading up to this project. Um, secondly, just to underline the point that Lynn made about the way the research participants acted as exhibition guides for the exhibition and talked to visitors about <coughs> their own artwork. And it came out in evaluation that visitors really like this. And I think it shows how by involving people meaningfully in research around things that they're really deeply interested in, um, they become advocates for it within their communities. And lastly, just a word about the phrase harder to reach because I, I've seen that in the, the workshop after this is framed partly in that way and I think it's worth thinking about that phrase. One of the youth workers that we worked with on the project said quite vehemently to us, our people are not hard to reach. <laughs> and obviously, you know, she meant that people are only hard to reach from a certain perspective, just as people are only low participators from a certain perspective. So we think there's a lot to learn here from kind of bottom-up community development type approaches. Now obviously everybody isn't doing participatory research, and nor should they be, but if you want to do an event like this, then we'd suggest that if your research doesn't already involve community engagement, you might consider partnering with experts in your own institution who are already working with communities and kind of have invested time already in building those relationships to see whether your festival events might have the potential to bring something of value to those communities. And once you're in a situation where people want and can see the value of what you're doing and have opportunities to help shape it as well, then you have public engagement. Mm -hmm.